Happy Friday evening. I have already done Facebook Live for today, for Five on Friday, but I have just reported a fault to Facebook. I definitely cannot get the tools in Facebook Live working um, to reverse the, um, it's still reversing the covers of books. And I don't feel like that's fair to the creators of the book who deserve to see their, you deserve to see their books this way around, not mirror image. So I've actually reported it as a fault to Facebook and I'm hoping they'll resolve that because it's just ridiculous and annoying. So I'm actually gonna record Facebook live again, my five on Friday, um, which now clearly won't be live, but I'm okay with that if you're okay with that. And you know, it's my Facebook page, so it's all it. I can make the rules. I just don't feel like it's fair to the creators. The first book that I talked about this afternoon was the second adventures of Princess Peony in which she doesn't want a prince, but she gets one anyway, but not for Keith's. It's by Nettie Hilton and Lucinda Gifford, and it's absolutely beautiful. It is for young readers, maybe independently from about six, um, or it would be a lovely read aloud to ones who are a little younger. It's very realistic. For example, there is the teeny weeny, um, tiny princess, tiny book of princess mistakes. And it says, sometimes princesses make mistakes, not very often and not huge ones for goodness sake. And they can usually be mended, usually. I just love it. It's a beautiful one for encouraging imaginative play. So Peony is um, obviously a real little girl and she has a brother, but she pretends that she is a princess and that her dog is a dragon and that her brother is a troll, as all brothers, you know, are, quite frankly. Um, so in this one, she, um, her brother wants her to prove that she really is a princess by turning a um, frog into a prince with a kiss. Um, and that does happen, but not in the way they both expect. And it's just really funny. It's a really good one. Um, Mum makes an appearance as the queen. It's just a really beautiful one for imaginative play. I love the work of Nettie Hilton. Many of you will know her for her most famous book, A Proper Little Lady. And this one follows in that same kind of whimsical, charming vein, but it's just, it's just super clever. I also really like the color scheme. It's just a two color print job. I like the pops of purple. The first one was pops of pink. Um, it's just, yeah, it's very giftable. It's hardcover. I think the two of them together would make a really beautiful gift. It's gorgeous, I adore it. A second book I'm going to talk about is Horatio Squeak. It is written by Karen Foxley and it is illustrated by Evie Barrow. Um, and this one is the first picture book by Karen Foxley. So Karen Foxley will be known to many of you as the award-winning middle grade author. She's written books such as Lenny's Book of Everything and A Most Magical Girl. She also has an adult book called The Wings of Anatomy, The Anatomy of Wings. Um, and she's, you know, incredibly well known for her beautiful, beautiful narratives always scary when they, um, you know, dabble in something else. I'm sure Karen's um, nervously awaiting reviews of this one as well. It's just gorgeous. Like with all Karen's books, there's a real um, sense of heart and soul um, in her writing. She explores issues of self-confidence and um, believing in oneself, and she just does it so beautifully every time. It's also a rhyming text, which again, I think can be really tricky to get right, but this one rolls off the tongue beautifully. It starts, in a very fine house, on a very grand street, lived the tiniest mouse you could possibly meet. His little green coat was threadbare and patched. If you looked very close, his socks were mismatched. Now Horatio Squeak is the youngest of 12 mouselings. I like the little um, three blind mice reference in here. And Horatio Squeak is quiet, a little bit timid, and really hasn't ever, um, isn't sort of the one that gets noticed in the family. Um, well, there is 12. Anyway, Horatio Squeak gets invited to a play date, his first ever. He gets his little invitation. He's never been to a party before. He's so excited. And then you turn the page, so excited, so excited. And his mum says, you're going to have to be really, really brave. Um, and he turns up at the door and look who it is. A cat has invited him and my dog's just run away from the picture of the cat because my dog is also very timid um, and on Valium. Anyway, back to the book. So, um, you know, and as an adult reading it, you go, Ooh, oh dear. And uh, well, most kids will also understand that, you know, cats and mice, they don't tend to mix without disturbing results. You know, and the cats do kind of play with Horatio. Anyway, 
Um, Horatio is very brave and he in fact solves a little bit of a dilemma at the party and he ends up kind of finding his brave. It's a theme that is explored over and over in picture book territory, but I think Karen Foxley, you know, is such an accomplished writer. It just works so beautifully. There's just, oh, it's just, it's really heartfelt. It's a great little message about finding your brave and it ends like this. For though he was small, he no longer, oh, did that stop? For though he was small, he no longer felt weak. And that is the tale of Horatio Squeak. It's just beautiful, really, really gorgeous. Beautiful end papers, which of course must be explored. Uh, next up is Goodbye House, Hello House, and it's by Margaret Wilde and Anne James. Now, this is a really fine example of what I always talk about. Please look at the end papers when you are reading this with little people or for yourself. So in this book, now my dog is eating. So in this book, um, the story really very much does start on the end papers. So here we see a little girl on her, or a little person on their front deck and there's packing boxes. So you would talk um, with whoever you're reading to about what they think might be going to happen. Why might there be boxes? Why might she be looking out at this farm? I love the dedication by Anne James. Um, it is. It says, hello painting and Photoshop, goodbye John Birmingham. I think that's a really beautiful dedication to John Birmingham, who was an incredibly well-known author illustrator of picture books, and he passed away in January 2019. So I think that's a really lovely um, tribute to John Birmingham and James. I love that. Now it's got Anne James's really, she's so well known for her line drawings, which have got such movement and life in them. But in this book, she's also combined, well, it says she's used Photoshop, so she's combined um, painting with um, her line drawings. Now, I love this illustration in particular. Look at the movement in that, this little girl swinging on the gate. It's a beautiful story, which, as I said, starts here with a bit of a goodbye to a house, rural setting, and it says, this is the last time I'll fish in this river. Beautiful text by Margaret Wilde. This is the last time I'll run through these trees. This is the last time I'll pat this pony. And so it goes on, goodbye kitchen, goodbye bathroom. And then we move to, this is the first time I'll push open this gate. And now we're in the new home. And she starts to say, hello to the new home. In fact, there's every possibility it's, oh no, it is a girl, Emma lives here. Um, and then it ends on the final end paper. And look at that end paper. And so much is said in that illustration. Can you see the little person waving hello from the window? And look where she's moved from, a rural setting to an urban setting. So I just think for visual literacy, this is now my go-to book for teaching um, visual literacy and the importance of reading images and the importance of reading um, end papers. It's exquisite. And my dog, buddy, Tyson, stop eating. It's not my stop eating. Um, I'm then going to go to Pie in the Sky by Remy Lay. This is absolutely beautiful. It's quite a thick novel, but it is um, it's part graphic novel, part a narrative. Um, it, well, it's all narrative, but it's part graphic novel, part novel, novel. I can't think of the word. It's Friday evening. Um, it is really, really fantastic. It's about a family who immigrate to Australia. They had been going to start up a um, cake shop called Pie in the Sky, um, which kind of means impossible dream. And um, the dad has passed away. And so those dreams are put on hold. But mum and the two sons do immigrate to Australia. Um, and mum now works in a bakery and the boys go to school. Um, the older brother is just divine. He has to look after the younger brother who's really mischievous. Um, he reminded me a lot of my younger brother, just kind of always getting into trouble. And he feels like he's landed in Mars when he arrives in Australia because he can't speak English and everyone might as well be aliens or he feels like the alien. He just cannot understand what they're saying. He's really struggling with learning Eng English He's also really struggling with the loss of his father. He's a bit confused as to why mum sometimes looks happy. How can she possibly be happy? Um, their whole lives have crumbled. You know, their dreams um, have all, you know, fallen in a big heap as far as he's concerned. These are the cakes they used to make in their bakery back home. Um, and now they make very different looking cakes. It's a really beautiful ex exploration. It's a really beautiful look at... Um, 
families and food and the power of cakes to solve all problems. It's just so great. It's Remy's first novel. She's got another one on the way. I'm recommending this one for readers from... Oh, look, my nearly eight-year-old could read this, but I think I'd prefer her to wait until she's maybe nine or even ten, um, maybe nine. Uh, it's just beautiful. It's got some really great stuff to pull out and dissect in there. It's just, I feel like this one's really going to go great places, and Remy is definitely somebody to watch. She's actually based in Brisbane, and she's got lots of holiday um, illustrating workshops happening at Riverbend and at the State Library through Booklinks, I think it is. So um, I'm really looking forward to getting along to some of those. Yeah, really somebody to watch. And then finally, I know lots of people have been um, waiting to find out about this one, Wolf Girl Into the Wild by Ando. Look, Ando's such a talented man, isn't he? He's just astonishing. Um, I've been lucky enough to meet him once or twice, twice I think, um, and he is as delightful as, as what he seems on, on TV and on radio. He's just absolutely delightful. This is his new series and it's, I think, much older than his um, other uh, books to date. So that's just a bit of a content warning and an age warning. I think this one is more suitable for kind of nine um, plus readers. So in this one, we have Gwen, who is a really strong, strong, strong female protagonist. And Gwen and her family are awoken in the middle of the night um, and they have to pack up and they have to flee their home. Um, as they are fleeing their home in their car, they've packed all their worldly possessions into the car, a bomb um, or something drops from the sky and um, the road um, is, is no longer passable. The family have to flee. And uh, Gwen's father has always talked about going with your gut instinct, Gwen. And he, he just tells Gwen to run. Um, the family is separated and Gwen does. She has to go with her gut instinct and her gut instinct is, I'm going to get out of here. And she runs. She awakens a while later to discover she is all alone, um, and she, except for this wolf cub. Um, and she sort of befriends this wolf cub and then in turn she finds some other dogs, some puppies, Chihuahua, a Labrador, a Greyhound, and then a little later a Rottweiler who's quite scary at first. Um, and she ends up kind of almost running with the dogs, um, forming this kind of pack with the dogs. It's a really fast paced adventure. It is just, it's so hard to put down. My seven year old got this one out of the letterbox um, and was just beside herself when she saw it was an Ando novel. And she read it all in one sitting. Literally, I could not get a word out of her. She was just sitting transfixed. She was clearly quite scared. At one stage, she may have started crying. Um, then I suggested maybe when I looked at it, I thought, eh, it might be a little bit old for you. Um, and always read a book before you give it to your children. And then when she finished it, she was like, I have got to have the second one right now. I have got to have the second one. And I was like, it's coming soon, mate. You can't have it now. I don't think he's probably even written it. So that was a little devastating for her. And it does end with a to be continued and quite a scary part happens. So, you know, bit of a content warning there. Look, it is. It's, it's scary. It's about families being separated. We don't know if Gwen's family are dead or alive. I have a few thoughts on it. It could be dystopian, so set in a future time, um, you know, and or I have another theory. I, I do wonder, given Ando's own background, I kind of feel like as soon as I was reading this story about a family having to pack up in the middle of the night due to war or some sort of terror activity and flee their home, perhaps their country, I just was like, this is a story of refugees and immigration and asylum seekers. And I just felt, I felt very strongly that was um, part of the message. It's a modern day context um, and it feels like it's in um, a setting that we all know, but it could be anywhere. The story could be transferred to any country in the world. So yeah, it's a really powerful story and it's a really, really fast paced one. It, I, it's, Look, my seven-year-old couldn't put it down. She probably, um, she did have nightmares for a few nights. But look, all good now, all good. Um, so just content warning on it, but it is just brilliant. So I can't wait until the second one comes out. Um, and I know this one will be an absolute bestseller. I just, Ando just appears to go from strength to strength. And he's such, 
a delightful person as well. So thank you, Arne, for taking the time to write stories for our children. That is all I have time for today, given I have already done this once. But as I said, I just didn't feel it was... I didn't feel it was right that the creators of the books had their books in mirror image. That was ridiculous. And I've reported it to Facebook as a fault. So uh, hopefully I'll be back on Facebook Live again next Friday. Um, but for now, I'm off to prepare a poetry workshop for 10 a.m. at Brackenridge Library tomorrow. And then I'm driving down to the ECTA conference, the Early Childhood Teachers Association conference to talk about visual literacy, one of my favourite topics. So I've got a really, really big weekend. And then next week I'm doing Brisbane City Council workshops all week. Um, but I'm really looking forward to them because I love a literary activity. I might see some of you there if you are based in Brisbane. See you later.